You might think that soldiers and veterans have a lot of social and political power, um, but they often have a lot less than you might think. Let's explore why. So in part one of my series, Building a Better Future for Military Families, I talked about bias and how civilian bias can make us think less of soldiers, veterans, and their families than we're even aware of. Um, and so in this part, I'm going to talk about power, political power, social capital, and how there's often less of it going around military families than you think. Um, and the reason for that is actually kind of complicated. On the one hand, we often in America, civilians often think that the military is one big thing. We can support the troops and maybe not need to actually specifically care about Johnny or Jane who came from the military. We're just going to subsume all soldiers' concerns and interests into one big glob we call the military. Um, and so this homogenization of the military actually works against getting to know soldiers and veterans and their families themselves. The fact is that one, there's one officer to five enlisted people. The people we're used to hearing from in society, the people who are smart and educated, talking heads, those are usually officers. And they represent less than 20% of the military. Most soldiers and veterans had been enlisted um, many of them have been to combat now in our uh, the last 20 years we've been at war. Um, but there's also even more than rank. There's military specialty, um, rank, grade, uh, length, and character of service. All of these different ways that military experience can be fleshed out also influences what kind of power you might have, social power, social capital that you might have. So if you had a dishonorable discharge, you're not going to have as much social capital as you know, a four-star general who served 30 years and goes on CNN every other week. Um, if, you're, uh, if you're a finance clerk when you were in, you're going to have less social capital than the special operator who like deployed 17 times to Afghanistan and knows three languages. Um, so these are the realities of service that influence the kind of power that an individual veteran or, so, or service member their family might have. But here's the rub. Some people may want political power. I want political power. I want the conversation to change around soldiers and veterans. I want human dignity for soldiers and veterans, and I'm willing to fucking fight for it. But not everybody wants to. I've spoken to plenty of other service members and veterans who just want to lay low, uh, who said, for example, one young man in seminary with me said, what they don't know, they being administrators, they being officers, what they don't know can't hurt me. So I'm going to remain under the radar. I'm not going to rock the boat because I know how fragile political power is. So what does political power or rather the lack of political power look like? For example, when I started a, an investigation, a complaint at Duke University, and it was just a shit show with how poorly done the investigation and the interviews was, um, I wasn't able to find uh, a satisfying uh, amount of accountability because the law that was written to protect veterans was written so poorly. We can write shitty laws for veterans and they won't change because veterans don't have the political power to change them. I'm not talking about just straight voting. I'm talking about the ability to rely on my service to affect change. In the 116th Congress, after discovering all the loopholes and gaping, you know, sucking chest wounds in Vevra, I pounded the pavement on Capitol Hill and I went to the House VA Committee, the House Armed Services Committee, the House uh, Committee on Education and Labor, all of these different committees in the House and in the Senate, and all, most, if not all of whom, were chaired by non-veterans. And when I spoke to staff, or if I got the opportunity to speak to a member themselves, they just kind of nodded their head, thank you for your service, and did nothing. The most glaring example of this is the, uh, with Mike Levin, who is now my own uh, representative here in Laguna Niguel, who hangs up on me, who accuses me of being angry and disrespectful, and nothing changes so long as civilians can rely on stereotypes and caricatures to dismiss the legitimate concerns of soldiers and veterans. That's what I mean by soldiers and veterans lack political power. We, I can't actually say I'm a veteran and therefore I deserve this 
I have to do more than that. I can't just vote. I can't just go to town hall meetings. There are things working against us organizing, internal things like uh, shut up and drive on mentality, uh, the kind of the don't rock the boat mentality that I got from other veterans. There are things working against us that ensure that our political power is going to be more difficult to assert than it would be for other groups that do have political power, that have organized and that do enjoy a certain amount of what some people call enfranchisement. So this second part has been about power, um, about its lack of power and what uh, soldiers and veterans have the power to do and not do. In the last part, part three of my series on building a better future for military families, I'll talk about what allies, civilian allies, and soldiers and veterans can do themselves to gain more political power, to assert our own human dignity, and to see the change that I think we all need to see in the world around military families, soldiers, and veterans.